to, to undertake this work. So that's what it is. You've got copies of the slideshow with places to write notes and stuff like that if you want to. Um, and there may be a couple that are out of order, but um, Jenny's going to talk about that when we're at I rearranged this afternoon. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Tom Hart. I'm with Community Strategies Institute, and it's great to be here. Um, it's really, uh, I think it's been kind of a whirlwind study for us, and I think you'll see, uh, I don't know if you have a hard copy of the actual report yet, um, but it's pretty dense with data, and I think it will provide some very interesting reading and reflection uh, for you as you go through it. I think uh, one of the things we were impressed with is that really, uh, I think as you look at some of the Boulder County and surrounding communities, uh, I think Longmont um, is in pretty good stead, and I think that um, uh, there's a, a, a very uh, good diversity of housing in Longmont. I think that's something uh, that you all can you know, take as a positive, and at the same time, I think looking to the future, I think the great challenge is you know, what kind of policies, what kind of approaches might help keep the same kind of um, fairly decent opportunity uh, that you have in the Longmont housing market right now. We're going to kind of lead off um, with at least some of the high points of the demographic and economic data of the research we did. I think that one of the things that's very interesting is we did a comparison uh, of five communities um, to kind of see how those other communities, how their market was playing in comparison to what was going on in Longmont. Those communities, I think, are in some ways similar. Uh, they have some some basic uh, similarities to, to Longmont, and I think you'll find it interesting just to see how uh, things compare. We're going to make some reference to it and talk a little bit about it in our slide presentation, but there's a lot more data uh, on the comparisons with those other communities uh, contained in the report, and I think you'll find that very, very interesting. We also will wrap up with some ideas and recommendations for you all to consider and uh, you know we've tried to provide both a, a range of, of recommendations uh, but one of the realities that you know we will talk about is that housing is an expensive um, process and it's it's kind of like one of those infrastructure things that it doesn't get done without an investment of money and I think that's part of what you all are going to have to come to grips with is just you know where does that money come from how much uh, uh, involvement does the public sector have in trying to help uh, make those investments work within the Longmont community? Uh, but you'll have some ideas there, and certainly, um, you know, our business is to kind of give you ideas, and we're not going to be uh, offended if you don't like some of our ideas or if you don't adopt some of our ideas. Uh, we're happy just to kind of engage with communities uh, and get people thinking about how housing and the role housing plays both in our economy and in people's day-to-day -day personal lives, how important that is for all of us. And uh, I think that that's part of, you know, the great work that you all are doing is trying to look at those values, look at those underpinnings uh, that have made Longmont, and I think as you'll see it, uh, Longmont has got a lot of very um, positive characteristics that people should be proud of. Um, another thing that we did is we did a survey of employees, and I think it was very interesting, uh, and we'll make some reference to that too, some of the uh, uh, comments that people made and some of the findings that we have uh, regarding um, kind of some of the reasons why people choose to live in Longmont and the fact that a lot of people do uh, prefer Longmont um, over other uh, communities in the area. And I think you'll find some of that survey. And we didn't include in the report the whole survey, but it is available. The city has a PDF copy of all the questions with all the tabulated responses. We also made available to the city an actual um, Excel spreadsheet with all the individual responses. So if somebody wants to do some real data crunching and do their own cross-tabbing, Kathy has um, those two documents that I'm sure she'd be happy to send to you uh, in your email. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to Jenny Rogers, and she's going to start the presentation. Hi. I get to go through the, uh, the data with you, so don't eat too much while we're doing this, or you might fall asleep. Um, let's see. As Tom said, we're going to give you some of the highlights of our report tonight. This is not all the data in our report, um, but some of the um, information that we thought was most interesting or valuable to um, your work. 
Um, so to begin our analysis, we prepared a demographic profile of Longmont, included looking at population and household statistics over time, tenure of households, which I'm sure you know is either whether someone's an owner or a renter, um, and cert looking at certain <coughs> groups among the population, such as seniors. Um, and so I'm going to give you some of the highlights. Um, Longmont's population grew by over 21% during the past decade to a population of 86,270 in 2010. Um, in comparison, Boulder County's population grew by 1.1% during the decade. Colorado's total population grew by 16.9%. So Longmont grew at a faster pace. Uh, the Colorado Department of Local Affairs demography section projects that Longmont's population will continue to grow um, from 2012 to 2016 to 95,070. And um, the correlating household number is growing by almost 4,000 new households. 11.2% uh, of your population is age 65 or plus. 60% of all Longmont households have one or two people in them, which are small households, considered small households. Um, this is a trend that's happening across the country. The percentage of renter households is on the increase as we've gone through our housing bubble and it's harder to become a homeowner. You know, some people are falling from homeownership to becoming renters again. Um, we see that in Longmont, renter households are rising from 34.4% of the population in 2000 to 36.5 in 2010. The other interesting thing about renter households, and this is common in many communities, is that they are smaller than owner households. The uh, median household size for renters is 2.51 in Longmont, and the median household size for owners is 2.61. Uh, we broke household income, households into income ranges using census data and special uh, HUD-created breakdowns of households by tenure and income range. And this information is helpful to determine what households can afford for rent or to purchase a house. Um, incomes were broken into HUD-determined income ranges to identify those that will qualify for restricted housing or various housing programs. Um, most affordable housing programs target renter household housing to households that earn 60% or less of a HUD limit, and ownership programs target households earning less than 80% of a HUD limit. As you can see here, um, the American Community Survey, which is the U.S. Census, uh, estimated Longmont's 2010 median household income at $69,685. And you'll remember that household size, the median household size, about 2.6, 2.5 something, 2.6. Um, the way HUD works is that um, they go by a county or an MSA of a statistical area and determine various income limits and ranges for that area. And, and Longmont Falls in Boulder County, which you all may be aware of. Um, so you can see that Longmont's median income from the census, which is calculated slightly differently, is much lower than the HUD Boulder County area median income of 93,800, um, which has some implications for where households fall in income ranges, although we still managed to capture all households in our analysis. Um, in Longmont, the majority of owners and renters earning 50% or less of the HUD area median income uh, in Longmont are considered cost burden. And uh, let me just give you a little background on what cost burden means. Um, a household is considered cost burdened if they pay more than 30% of their income for housing. Those, if you are a household that pays between 30 and 49% uh, of your household income for housing, you are considered cost burdened. If you pay more than 50% of your income for housing, you are considered severely cost burdened. Um, and so you'll see here the majority of owners and renters earning 50% or less of the HUD area median income long, in Longmont are cost burdened. You have numbers on severely cost burdened? Yes. 
I don't need them tonight, but just as long as they're available it's, in the report. It is in the report. Okay. Could you repeat the question, too, please? Uh, yes, the question was, do we know how many are severely cost burdened in Longmont? And I, it's in the report. That's, that's it fine. Is, Um, 18.5 percent of low-income renters. Oh, I'm sorry. 18.5 percent of all households that are low. Income. We looked at um, three sources of commuting data. This was an issue that the task force really wanted to look at: was what's happening with employment and commuting in Longmont, and how does that uh, how does that affect the housing market? Um, so we looked at three sources of commuter data. We looked at census data that's collected yearly by the um, something called the Labor Employment Dynamics Series. We, um, as Tom said, with the city's help, conducted an online commuter survey um, where we captured information from over a thousand, seventeen hundred, maybe twelve hundred uh, employees in Longmont, and asked where those employees are commuting into Longmont from. And then we also looked at uh, a report from the Boulder and Broomfield County's labor migration profile from 2010. Um, and each showed slight variations on where commuters to Longmont are originating from, but um, Boulder, Loveland, Denver, and the Tri-Cities areas of Frederick, Firestone, and Decono um, were consistently high on each list. Um, and one of the things that we noticed in a few of the reports was the numbers would indicate that it, it looked like um, more and more people are having to commute into Longmont for employment. And that was uh, so, uh, one of the worries that um, someone indicated as we're going into this project. And, and really what's happening is that um, the number of commuters out of Longmont is rising but the job market has stayed fairly stable in Longmont. Really, the population has been growing. And so those folks are commuting in and out for jobs elsewhere. And, and you're not necessarily having a higher level of commuting. Um, there is kind of a new analysis of housing costs that was developed by a think tank called the Center for Neighborhood Technology out of Chicago for over 300 major metro areas in the country called the Housing and Transportation Index, or the H plus T Index, um, which is very interesting, especially as you're looking at commuting patterns. Um, what it does is it, it um, shows for the communities that are in this index um, the combination of how much, what percent of income households are paying for for housing and then it adds in their transportation costs. And as we're looking at commuting patterns in and out of Longmont, and especially housing prices, where you may have a cheaper housing market outside of Longmont, but then you're driving 30 miles into Longmont to work, the H plus T index is, is an important thing to consider when we look at um, total cost for housing. Um, and researchers for this index believe that um, it's healthy for households to spend no more than 45% of their income for housing and transportation. Um, and we're going to present more about the H plus T index a little bit later and compare Longmont to some other communities. But right now you can see that Longmont's H plus T index currently is 47.51%, slightly above that healthy level. Next we looked at, yeah, yep. But it said that we have the lowest housing plus transportation index in surrounding community. You do. So we're better off than some of the other. And, yeah, and, I, and I'm gonna, I'll get into that a little bit later. That's a good point. You are lower than other communities. And in fact, you have, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you ahead of time, you have a, a, a higher percentage of households paying less than that 45%. H plus T than the other communities in the surrounding areas. So when you compare Longmont to other areas, you're in better shape. And and Longmont, when we look at the labor market and commuting, Longmont has, for the Boulder County area, the highest number of employees living in Longmont and not commuting to and from. 
Um, and so it really does show that you have a healthy community of housing and and employment. So that's a good point. Next, we took a look at um, the housing stock, and we did a detailed review of the existing housing stock in Longmont, development trends, and the pipeline for future development. Um, we looked at units themselves, their prices, and their availability. Um, so 72.5% or the majority of all housing units in Longmont are single family homes. Only 5.7% are in buildings with 20 or more units. Um, over 5,000 of the 6,900 units built since 2000 were single family homes. Um, while con the construction of single family homes has declined significantly since 2001, the current development pipeline includes more single family homes than attached units, and that trend is continuing, although the ratio between the two is declining, and I, I th there are Percentage-wise, there's more multifamily units in the pipeline than there had been in the past. You can see that um, uh, permits, again, have declined rapidly since 2001 to 119 in 2011. The current development pipeline includes 976 single-family homes, 81 attached for-sale units, and 426 multi-unit rentals. We reviewed Boulder County trustee and assessor's data um, and found that foreclosures in Longmont are on the decline. Um, foreclosure, foreclosure filings declined 29% between 2010 and 2011, and foreclosure sales declined by 24% in that same time period. Uh, when we look at 2012, it's a little hard to tell what's going to happen by the end of the year. Um, it looks like filings may stay at the same level or decrease a little bit, and sales appear to continue to decline, which is good news. Um, the assessor's office was able to give us, and you'll see a map in our report, of um, foreclosure sales by some neighborhood areas that they defined from the assessor's office. And we mapped the, the uh, foreclosure filings, or the foreclosure sales and the percent of foreclosures in those areas and found that um, in 2011 and 2012 to date, it seems like foreclosure sales are concentrated in the northwest area of Longmont. Do foreclosure sales include short sales? Uh, no. What was the question? Do they include short sales? Next, we looked at housing prices. Um, and I want to thank um, especially Melinda Gale for helping us spending hours and hours of time collecting MLS uh, records for us so that we could look at a, the housing sales market, and also uh, Deanna Dyer for um, leading us in the direction of um, sales statistics over time. They really helped us in our housing analysis, housing price analysis. Um, what we did with MLS records that were provided by Melinda is we took those detailed listings and sales records as of May and loaded them up into an access database so that we could create all kinds of different analysis on them. What we found was that in May, there were 367 homes on the market in Longmont with an average square uh, single family sales price of $324,977 and an attached uh, average sales price of $220,894. Um, prices were concentrated in the 150,000 to 300,000 price range. This is from the MLS. This is from listings, not sales. Um, this was listings. We also looked at sales. So current listings, and they are higher than sales prices. Listing prices are. Um, and the median sales price for a single-family home in April of 2012 was uh, approximately $239,000. That's information provided by um, Longmont Title and the MLS um, averages for the month. So it is lower. And in our report, we, we talk about the fact that uh, the median sales prices are lower and that some of the units that are on the market may have been sitting there for a while because their prices are 
Uh, we also conducted a rent and vacancy survey in June um, and July to determine current rents and vacancies in Longmont. Um, we were able to survey over 2,200 rental units in a variety of properties, including single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, smaller rentals, and then uh, I think we got all of the larger properties with um, 100 to 400 rental units in them. What we found was an average rent in long run of $900 and a vacancy rate of only 2.4%. A healthy market has a vacancy rate of about 5%. So you have a very tight rental market. And this number indicates that there's a need for more rental units. So just more quickly to clarify, that's, that's a combination of both apartments and single family and is that across the board? Across the board market. market. Um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. In the report, there's some charts that show of the responding properties, how many were single family, how many are smaller rental properties, and how many in larger complexes. When you look at the total properties, we got a, a good mix. When you look at the total units, because some of the properties are so large, um, it's weighted towards the larger properties, multi-unit properties. Next, we looked at housing availability um, and how many units are available for those who might want to rent or um, purchase a home in Longmont. When you look at overall total sales volume in Longmont, it's declined from 2011 to 2012. And in fact, it's declined from 2008 to 2012. Um, but when you look at an analysis of month to month sales, so the January sales in 2011 compared to the January sales in 2012, February, March, April, which is what we have data up until, um, sales have increased every month compared to the year before in Longmont. So the, it, it appears that the number of sales in the sales market is picking up and that sales are increasing. Is that what you would say is? Definitely. Yeah. So it shows that the sales market is, is rebounding. Um, vacancies, like we said, are low. They're lower for larger units, meaning units with three or four bedrooms, which there are many uh, less of on the market than one and two bedroom units. So uh, we see a declining vacancy rate as the units have more bedrooms. Um, we also collected information about all of the rent and income restricted rental properties in Longmont and found that there were, we tallied 1,749 restricted units on the market, <coughs> meaning that um, there is some sort of income threshold that you can't go over to live there and that rents either are subsidized through a rent subsidy to the tenant or have a cap that is affordable at certain income levels. Very few of those units were vacant. Um, some of the properties have waiting lists, although um, many of the owners aren't even keeping waiting lists because they can rent units so quickly when they turn over. Um, the Longmont Housing Authority and others also have Section 8 rental assistance vouchers. Um, these are, uh, this is rental assistance that goes to a household and then they're able to go out into the market and find a unit of, um, that's privately held or in an affordable property. And uh, we found that I think the Longmont Housing Authority has 451 vouchers, Boulder County Housing Authority has another 288, and then the Center for People with Disabilities um, has 30 vouchers targeted to people with uh, disabilities. One of the things you wanna do when you're trying to figure out needs in a community is look at supply and demand disconnects um, and what we've done we compared the number of households at various income levels to the estimated number of housing units that were either affordable to rent or afford to purchase in their income levels and these are just some of our findings we found that there's a shortage of rental units in Longmont targeted to almost all income ranges but especially for households at 50 percent or less of the area median income that's a gap of 1449 units um, we found that there is an adequate amount of for sale housing available in Longmont, that if, but if you are a household at 60 to 80 percent of the area median income or less, you'll probably need down payment assistance from the city to afford your unit. 
we also estimated that in the zero to 80 percent area median income classification that there's probably a little over 700 households who could become owners in if they found an affordable unit and had some assistance. One of the tasks that we um, had from the task force was to create an analysis of Longmont's housing prices and the availability of housing for the Longmont workforce. To do this, we used results from our commuter survey. Um, and employees who took the survey were asked if they were owners or renters, and then they were also asked what their total household income was. That's not what their wage was. Would you be kind enough to go back to the previous slide? Sure. Okay, uh, the, the gap is roughly 1,500, 1,449. And on the bottom, you say the people who, are, who will qualify is 734. So the top number is uh, the gap of rental units. So um, what we did is we looked at um, the number of renters in different income ranges, and then we looked at how many units are available to them and came up with that gap number. The bottom numbers are talking about renters who would want to become owners. So it's uh, the gap for rental housing and then the gap for for sale. Is there some context behind that 1,449 number in, in how that compares to other communities uh, in, anywhere in the, in the report? Would you repeat the question? We, so we, we want to know if there's a context for how that 1,449 compares to other communities? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we, in our analysis of comparison communities, we look at some different ratios of housing prices um, to La in Longmont and the other comparison communities. It's a little tough. We would have to go in and do a gap calculation for other communities, which is um, fairly labor intensive, to, um, to identify the exact gap in other communities. So the answer is no, we do not have an exact gap calculation for other communities, but we do have analysis of how Longmont compares to some of the surrounding communities in terms of housing prices. Um, so for the jobs housing balance, um, like I was saying, we used um, information from our commuter survey determining if the respondent was an owner or a renter, and then we looked at the distribution of their incomes by tenure. So by, we looked at owners and the distribution of their incomes, and renters and the distribution of, of their incomes um, in our commuter survey. And then what we did is we know the total number of employees in Longmont, and so we use that distribution to estimate the incomes of all the employees in Longmont for this jobs housing balance analysis. Um, we then uh, looked at what price was affordable to households in each income range and compared them to the median prices of homes sold in Longmont for owners and the average rent and utilities for renters. And as you'll see, we found that Longmont employees who earn $50,000 or more who are owners can't afford the median priced home in Longmont. Um, Longmont employees, and I should say who earn, this is their total household earnings, so it's not necessarily one job. It could be one job, it might be two jobs, it could be two uh, household members. Um, Longmont employees who earn $40,000 or more can afford the average rent and utility payment, which we've estimated at $9.75. We've added some utility costs into that. And that's about a $20 an hour wage. 23% of employees who own and 39% of employees who rent can't afford median prices in Walmart. Does that uh, reflect that it depend on how many members are in the household? Um, no, because what we did is we only compared their household income to a median price. So we didn't um, look at the size Really, what you would want to do for that is a size of house yeah. to make sure it matches up with the size of the house. Mm -hmm. Jen? Yeah. Are, did you ever, or could you ever figure a 
financial labels for either uh, purchase tools, because a lot of them need a different name, like HOA and also the, the rental unit into the into the housing costs for the, the the price that's affordable no we did not but we have you're right you can do that in analysis if you're looking specifically at what especially for attached usually although maybe a lot of your subdivisions have hoa fees as well yeah i think that's a, a big issue where mm -hmm. unaffordable homeowners are not getting the And that's a good point, right? Costs. The rising cost of the HOA fees. Um, the fifty thousand dollars. Are we saying that a family with an income of fifty thousand dollars can afford three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars home? Two hundred and thirty-nine. The median priced home sold in, and I, and you know what? Let me give you a visual here. Because over here we have the three twenty-five. So the median, yeah, those are the listing right. prices. Okay. The median so price back. sold yeah, in right. April was two thirty-nine, and that's what we used. So let me explain. This is a a visualization of what I was um, just describing to you. Along the x-axis, we have incomes, and I know it's a little hard to see from your seats. This is also in the report. So there, those are the employee income ranges. Then on the y-axis or the um, vertical axis, we have different various sales prices going from zero to nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. The median price in April, the two thirty-nine, is that orange line, um, and each bubble represents the number of households in each of those income ranges. So we used the two thirty-nine because that was this median sales price the last month that we had data for. Um, and so we're showing at that 50,000 threshold that they're crossing the line and below the households at 50,000 or less are falling below. Matt, I know you're ma not making any value judgments on that, but by definition, that should be the case that 23% you know, of employees or whatever that number is, 50% should be the middle number anyway. When you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're under that number, obviously, somebody is at 23% uh, other than the Right. If 23% if 23 can't afford it, 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 it means that most can. That's right. Is that what you're saying? Well, well you, you would, it's just a statistical. Go ahead. Okay. May I ask one other question? Yeah. If you refer to the computer survey, what was the date of that? We closed the commuter survey. We opened it in the end of May. Or right. be, in I the end of May, it. and we closed it mid June. No, okay. went all the way to the end of June. But, yeah. but it's current. I mean, yeah, it's very current. We bad. started it for this project. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was was and, 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 and Tom's going to go through some of the results from that. But it was an online mm -hmm. survey. Um, that was posted on the city's website and then um, through different working groups from the Economic Development Department and CAT and the um, city personnel and all kinds of different connections, a link was also sent to as many employers as we could find or posted on different websites and things for employer, employees to answer. So that's a good question. Um, so it's as, I mean, we closed it right when we started writing up the report, so it's, it's current. Anybody have any questions on how this is laid out? I've got the same chart for renters. And, you know, not surprisingly, renters overall have lower incomes than owners. Um, and so 39% of renters can't uh, afford the average rent utility payment that we've estimated of 975 PC. Um, something interesting, I think, with the renters, which is not necessarily the same case as owners, is that, um, well, 39% can't afford that 975. If you go just slightly above that to $1,300, which is those earning 60,000 or less, 66% of renters fall in that range. 
So you don't have to go very high above the average to have most of your renters or the majority of your renters kind of clumped in that middle rent range. Does that make sense? This is back to the tran uh, transit and housing cost comparisons um, that Melinda was asking about. Um, to expand our analysis of the Longmont workforce and their ability to pay for housing in Longmont, we wanted to look at comparing Longmont to four other surrounding communities or areas. And this was one of the tasks that your task force asked us to do. Um, the communities were chosen based on the commuter survey information gathered for the study, um, as well as our other commuter uh, sources. Um, and then we also thought about their size and their compatibility to Longmont. Um, as you know, the task force was interested in determining whether Longmont's housing prices and availability are driving employees to live elsewhere. And so this analysis was done to determine whether that was happening. So we chose Burford, Loveland, Lafayette, and then the tri-city areas of Dakota, Firestone, and Frederick. And this slide shows that H plus T index that we talked about earlier, um, and you can see that Longmont has the lowest um, average H, H plus T index of all the communities. Um, we reviewed a series of key indicators for Longmont in each comparison community related jobs, commuting, housing prices and affordability, and housing availability. Um, and the first looked at jobs and commuting. First, we determined a jobs housing unit ratio for each community. This is the number of housing units divided by the total number of jobs. And as you can see on this slide, we've got Burford, the Tri-Cities, Lafayette, Loveland, and Longmont. The bars are the job housing ratio. And then our line is the percent of workers who commute out of town for work. Um, Loveland and Longmont have the highest ratios, which is the jobs housing unit ratios, as they're considered employment centers and also residential communities. The others, especially the Tri-City area, have less jobs and are communities that are made up predominantly of commuters. Um, as I said, the chart also shows the percent of workers who are commuting out of town to work, and you'll see again in the communities with the lower job housing unit ratio, we've got higher percentages of residents commuting out to work. And Loveland and Longmont have the lowest percentages of residents commuting out of town for work. And I think this job and commuting analysis really shows that Longmont is a community where workers are choosing to live and, and stay to work. Our next comparison was prices and affordability. affordability. And while employees may want to live in a community, prices can make this cost prohibitive in some places. So we analyzed affordability in Longmont in comparison to the other communities. Both of the Tri-Cities and Loveland are all considered moderately unaffordable. Um, and you'll have more information about this in the detailed report, but this classification was made using something called the Demographia International Housing Affordability Survey of 358 International Urban Markets. That's a, um, it categorizes the, multi, uh, the multiple into affordable categories using a numeric system. Communities that are moderately unaffordable, as are both the Tri-Cities in Loveland, have a median house price when divided by the median household income that's between 3.1 and 4.0. An affordable community would be 3.0 or less for this index. So what we have on this chart is we have the median price of homes sold in April 2012, that's the red bars. We have the median income, which is the orange line, and then this index number which is kind of a, a median multiple, just trying to rate how affordable housing is in the numbers. So Berthet, Tri-Cities, and Loveland are all below 
when we look at uh, Lafayette and Longmont, they're both considered seriously unaffordable, which is a, a range of 4.1 to 5.0. And you'll see Longmont is very close to the bottom of that range, and Lafayette is very close to seriously unaffordable, which would be 5.1. When you look at the data, what we found is that Longmont is considered seriously unaffordable in this index really because of lower incomes, and Lafayette is considered seriously unaffordable because of higher prices. So Longmont, while it just tipped into the seriously unaffordable category, really housing prices here are, are fairly affordable, but uh, incomes are lower than a lot of these other communities. Good question. Oh, sorry. You do, you do these studies every day, right? So if you looked up and down the front range, I mean, Colorado is a very desirable place. It's not Oklahoma. Thank goodness. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, in context, since that looks at the cities across the country, in context to Colorado in the front range, with your experience, how does the 4.3 stack up? Could you repeat the question? So the question is, um, you know, how does Longmont in these areas compare to other parts of the country? And to be honest, I didn't look at a listing of other cities in the country. Actually, actually. I said, how do they compare oh, to the to, rest, to of, the the rest range? of the front range? I don't know. I think we did look at I, Boulder is high. Um, but And I expect that Denver is higher as well. Uh, but we didn't look at Adams County or Douglas. We haven't conducted this analysis in the rest of the country. I think overall Longmont is more affordable than many of the areas in the front range. You do have some of the older suburbs, probably in Adams County or Jeffco, where you're comparable to. Um, and so you might have a lower index there, but for the most part, a lot of Arapahoe, Douglas, Denver is going to be higher. That's my educated guess. Any other questions? Uh, next, we looked, looked at housing availability and created a new housing units to housing household ratio. Um, new households moving into a community, employees have to be able to find housing that's affordable to them when looking. Um, so we analyzed the availability of housing in each of these comparison communities to see how well they're keeping up building housing for new households. We calculated a new housing units to household ratio, dividing the number of new households in the area between 2002 and 2010 by the total number of new housing units that were built in that community. Um, and again, Longmont had the highest ratio of new housing units per household, building more housing units from 20, 2002 to 2010 than the community gained households, which means that you're keeping up. Berthet and Loveland also had positive ratios where the Tri-Cities and Lafayette had negative ratios. So this is an indicator that Longmont has been keeping up with demand for new housing inventory better than these other communities in the analysis. In fact, Longmont had the highest. Yeah, the question. Yeah, you have a question like that? Yeah. It would seem to me, and this is my own opinion, that that, would, that number would be based on a front-loaded period of time, 2002 to 2007, where a lot of activity happened. But since 2007, is the data, data parse that we could actually look at that the last five years to see if we're keeping up? Um, the it's source not, data is, yes, it's, it's American fun. Community Survey so data. We look at the last five years mm -hmm. apply the same calculation. Yeah, we could do that. Um, I. I'm trying to remember, I used 2002 because that was when we could gather all the sources from the American Community Survey for all of these communities. You know, they've been adding communities on as they've grown. Okay. Um, but I think past 2002, we could get a, uh, like a 2005 or a 2008, whatever you want. But let, me, let me just piggyback on that, Michael, because I think it shows some other things that we've seen already and we'll see throughout is that while the housing production looks good because we did have those earlier years, I mean, we can tell just looking at building permits, it's down now. 
yet population is growing, and you see kind of where that's budging up is in that rental demand, where people can't find a rental unit, and you know there may not be a new place to buy that they can afford the first time in the community either. Yeah, I think that's right. Did it, did this, this is looking at just for sale? It looks at ha total housing units. Okay, so it did look at rental. And all households. Okay. Um, and, but I think that what Tom said, and I think what Michael's alluding to, is are valid points because, you know, as we talked about permits and we talked about what's been produced, and we look at what's in the pipeline, and then we look at those rental demand and owner demand. You know, one of our conclusions really is that um, there's housing stock for sale out there right now that we need to catch up to selling what's there, and and the market's picking up. Um, to do that, but the rental demand is has not been keeping up because it, the the production hasn't been keeping up with the demographic and the break in tenure between renters and owners. And I I'm not sure I understand. There's a red there's a dark red line and a red line. Yeah, and, 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 there, and you don't have um, a magnifying glass to see. Okay, so yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't do that on this one. Um, the lighter orange bar is household growth. The darker orange bar is housing unit growth. So you'll see um, Longmont and Loveland have the higher dark bars. And then these circles are the new housing units to household ratios. So you see how you know, Lafayette's down here. Eric has pointed out that if I just bothered to look at this Oh yeah, that's right, you have those. Thank you. Um, that's the end of the data that I'm going to present. Does anyone else have any questions on those slides before I turn this over to Tom? There's a pointer in there too if you want. Oh. <laughs> okay, as we mentioned before, we did quite a bit of uh, detailed comparison with kind of the surrounding communities that seem to be the most similar. And I think in some ways, this slide is going to give you a little bit of what the takeaway is from some of the charts and graphs. Uh, and I think you'll all probably find it very fascinating. Uh, when you get into that section on the comparisons, because we have a lot more data uh, included in that. But things that you probably already know, Longmont has evolved into being a regional center. It's not no longer agriculturally based. Um, you've got residents and employees. A lot of people live here and work here, and that's that's a sign of a good, balanced community. I think one of the interesting things that this whole neck of the woods is going to be dealing with is just what the impact of that I-25 commuter corridor is because people we found a lot of people in the survey they move up and down from Denver to Fort Collins and a lot of them they don't really know if they're in Boulder County or Well County or uh, Larimer County and they don't know if they're in Longmont or in Firestone uh, and it's becoming kind of a, um, a, a geographic area that's kind of beyond political boundaries and you know I think what you'll see if in the future is elected officials are probably going to have to get more into a regional mode to try to figure out uh, some of the issues, including probably some housing issues, uh, and how to deal with that because of that tremendous fluidity that takes place up and down 25. Um, again, Longmont's unique because it does have such a high percentage of workers who live in the community. Uh, you've also got a very high length of residency. We have, in the survey, you'll see it in a little bit, a lot of people have been here for many years. It's not like they're just all newcomers. Um, Lovell and Longmont have the lowest vacancy rates of, of the other communities in rentals. Uh, some of the other communities don't have many rentals, and that, that affects everybody regionally. Uh, you know, the newer communities really haven't done much about renting, and you know, if you look at land use policies in some of the communities to the east here, they don't really even acknowledge that somebody might want to do rental housing. Um, what we see is that in, in, in the communities with a more balanced uh, ratio between jobs and housing, you have a little bit more stable housing market. And I think that's that's been a good step uh, in the past, and the declines haven't been as radical. And as long as that can kind of be maintained, then maybe we won't see this kind of runaway 
uh, escalation of prices like we saw in the early 90s. But again, that's going to be, you know, my own basic prediction is that we'll probably have another period of time that we're entering into right now where somebody somewhere opens a gate and says, go to northern Colorado, and, and they'll be coming again. And it'll be interesting to see how faster population growth impacts these markets. Um, Longmont's larger rental inventory has many more rental units than the other communities. And the reality of it is, is that, you know, it serves those other communities too, because you have people, uh, you have people that, you know, may be working somewhere else and they can't find a, a rental unit close to their job east of here or a little bit further to the south. And so Longmont does have a rental supply, even though right now it really is pretty much filled up. Um, but, but that's been, a, it's a strong inventory. And you'll see in the comparison, it's fairly interesting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, commuter survey, and I think you'll find the, the information in our report interesting about that, too, is uh, of the people who took the survey, about 1,060 worked in Longmont. 56% um, of the people say that they have worked in Longmont for nine years or longer. I think that's pretty impressive. survey, um, you see that um, about 83% uh, of the responses were completed by homeowners. Uh, this, is, I think, is really interesting. 43.5% um, of the people said that one of the primary considerations they had in choosing a house was a distance from work. So uh, even though we know there's a lot of people on the roads all the time, I mean, that is a prime consideration for, for a lot of homeowners. Um, and 43% of the people also said housing costs was one of the considerations. 23% said quality of the schools was one of the important considerations for why they chose their area. Uh, and again, this gets back to this kind of even demographic that's happening in this community now. About the same number of people who took the survey indicated they had children and this did not have children. 8.1% um, of the people that responded were single parents. Um, and then 12.9% was only one individual in the household. 60% of the people that responded have a commute time of under 20 minutes. I think that's good. Um, less than 8% said they commuted more than 40 minutes. This one had probably needs some improvement. 90% of the people go to work in a private car by themselves. Um, but the next highest was people that ride their bikes. So uh, that's encouraging too. Um, the other three areas of the, P of the employees that responded to the survey account for not a, a major chunk of it. In, in the Tritown area, you had 5.2%, in Loveland, 6.2%, um, and in Bertha, 3.5%. Oh, I'm sorry, could you further explain that last piece? Is that the number? Well, it means when people reported when they were asked, um, you know, they, the, first, the first cut was whether they were an employee in Longland. Then, they, they, we asked where they came from, and mm -hmm. those were the breakdowns of people that came from other places. Oh. Um, I think it's interesting, again, that the majority say that they've lived in the same place for nine years or more. Um, and But then those who responded when we asked them um, if they would consider living in Longmont, a significant number of people said no, they were happy where they were. Um, but some of the considerations people had um, was that they might move if they could find a more affordable home. Um, a lot of people identified lower price single family homes. Um, a lot of people identified higher quality. And I think that's interesting is it, it does seem that if there were, and I think a lot of times people define quality as size and yard, how big the yard is, that sort of piece of it. Um, but that, that's probably another area of the market, even a long month that, that, that appeals to people. Um, again, people who are renters, they want to see lower rents. Um, they want to see higher quality rental units. Almost consistently, the people that responded as renters, 19% um, of the respondents said they want to see more choice in the attached market. I think, again, that's encouraging that people are you know, looking to the attached market as a way of helping with affordability. Um, 
Again, almost all the writers wanted a less costly mental option. I want to now talk a little bit about another area that we looked at, and we're asked to look at the regulatory environment in Longmont, and um, you know, what that means. We really, when you start talking about regulation, um, you know, that takes that takes in a lot of stuff. But I think a lot of times uh, we get we forget just exactly how many layers we're dealing with when you're looking at the cost of bringing a dwelling unit onto the market. Um, housing production, I, I think in the study I've done, is one of the more regulated areas. If you want to do something simple, go be a brain surgeon. If you want to do something complicated, try to build housing. Uh, and you, I mean, you really look at, at how much goes into it. You know, the feds have tremendous level of rules and regulations. Uh, even going back now, everybody's reading about LIBOR and that's kind of a new concept for a lot of people, and so even the banks in London's have an impact on our interest rates. Uh, then state environmental laws, land use laws, banking, real estate regulations, they all influence the finished product. Local governments have regulations as far as building codes, <coughs> licensing, impact fees, real estate taxes, uh, and a whole lot of other miscellaneous requirements. You know, some people, when they look at this and study it, um, Estimate that about 40% of the cost of a finished housing product is attributable to regulation. You know that, that that's high. I've seen even higher higher numbers on that. Um, but again, I think one of the realities is that as homes become more expensive, uh, fewer people are going to have the ability to afford, you know, what we're putting out into the market. Um, some good information about the Longmont building scene, though, is that the people that are involved in the building, development, the real estate business. Those people that had some view outside the community, beyond the community, they felt that a lot of the uh, uh, requirements in Longmont were not as monumental or as numerous as they found in working in other communities. Uh, and as we look back at the history and look at some of the things that have been done with the building and planning process here in this community, one of the things that we saw is that there have been several housing task forces, just like you all, that have looked at some of the regulatory issues around uh, trying to make things simpler and less costly, and a lot of those reforms over the years have been implemented, and I think that shows that it is an applicable system here uh, still in the long run. Um, based upon what we heard from people, it looks to us like the regulatory environment you know, supports developers, but at the same time, you know, it's trying to encourage quality development, it's trying to make sure that the new development, both rental and homeowner that comes online, you know, has the kind of amenities people want with sidewalks, parks, and all the other great stuff that Longmont has. I think one of the interesting things, too, that this community is going to be grappling with more, and it definitely has an impact on how people view the regulatory environment, is the fact that the city is now looking at, at doing build-out studies. And basically what that means is that because of both the natural and political boundaries, uh, at some point, there's going to be a point where there may not be much more for annexation. Uh, and the city right now um, has a build-out scenario that says that basically there's probably room under current zoning assumptions and land use regulations that they can you know, that they can have about another 10,000 units. Well, you can see with population and just the projections we're doing on the short term, uh, in the future, you know, people are either going to have to reconsider density or you will be bumping up against that. Uh, and one of the things that we research shows, and we've seen it, is that if once you get to a point where people start to see the land as a very limited commodity, then you know the pressure upon elected officials for more regulation becomes greater because people want to make sure that that last bit of land is you know done perfectly and meets all all their their hopes and all their visions. Um, however, the other side of the coin is that. Research also shows that in terms of housing prices and, and regulatory costs, if the government could maintain more of a reactionary mode and kind of have a more relaxed approach and let high density stuff happen, let lower density stuff happen, uh, that probably in the end um, they can maintain lower cost housing than if they get really proactive and uh, get too heavy in some of the uh, things that other communities have done with urban growth boundaries and limited service areas where they say we won't allow water and sewer taps in this area, this is going to be only for a small farm. Um, those kind of things all, of course, you know, 
restrict the amount of land available and make it more costly uh, because there's more competition to buy the land that is available for development. We also look uh, at the fee structure, and the city recently completed, completed a, a comparison on the fees in a number of surrounding areas, and uh, long month fees generally um, look like they're very reasonable and they're in line with other areas, and the residential side, uh, long month is the second least costly behind only uh, Greeley. On the multifamily side, Longmont ranks ninth most expensive out of 13, so it's more expensive um, on the uh, on the uh, multifamily. Again, uh, one of the issues that we heard and the people we interviewed is that um, uh, they thought that maybe the park fees needed to be reviewed and that they were maybe a little bit high uh, for the city of Longmont. And certainly in the fee study comparison, uh, Longmont's park fees are, are, are pretty good. Um, they're, they're, they're right up there at the top, and that actually is part of uh, what we think kind of drives why the uh, regulatory cost on multifamily is a little bit higher. Now, they've also, the city has in some developments uh, where it's been targeted for affordable and some priority development areas, they have been willing to make some concessions on that. In the process of doing the research and talking to people, we found out that the city is, in fact, now reviewing. Uh, their kind of long-term parks plan and capital improvement plans to see whether or not it makes sense if they can lower uh, some of the park allocation fees uh, and maybe make it a little bit uh, less costly for the parks. Um, again, another important tool that's been used in Longmont is uh, what's been called the Water Wastewater Fee Offset Program for affordable housing. And again, if a developer is willing to make a certain number of units, in essence, restricted, uh, by income or rent range, uh, they can receive basically uh, some backfill help to pay those fees from other sources. Um, and that helps, you know, lower the cost of the housing by lowering the overall fees. Um, as the city moves forward, and there are some big redevelopment opportunities uh, that are in the future there, that we think that city wastewater and food waiver program is going to be a very important tool because if you look at some of the more intensive dense urban style developments, uh, the overall construction costs of those tend to be higher. So the city's going to look, have to look at everything it can do to try to help maintain a cost of development that will make the end result affordable to the people, both buyers and renters in Longmont with the income they have to spend. Uh, you know, and there, there are a variety of things that have been used here, um, and sometimes even help with infrastructure costs. Uh, and those are going to be they're going to be very important in order to uh, get affordable units in some of those more dense developments. Looking at the future, you know, we, we can say categorically there's a strong demand for more rental housing. Um, there certainly is a strong demand for affordable housing. If you think back for a minute on that bubble chart too, there were some bubbles up there in the higher income ranges. We think that there could be some. Uh, uh, a little bit more maybe luxury oriented rental development done. And we think that probably one of the things that would happen is if, if there were some nicer units with maybe more amenities, that sort of thing, some of the higher income folks would go ahead and take those and that would free up some of the more moderately priced units that they live in now just because that's what's available. Um, the, the rental housing continues to get more challenging and part of it is because the reality is, is the home ownership rates are going down. Uh, and that's not only because of uh, lack of market, it's also because uh, underwriting and bank policies have gotten much stricter. Uh, and that's an important thing too. It's, it's harder to get people through the maze. Uh, we think that the, the market, and we're not necessarily quantifying that absolutely, but we think for the next several years, the market could easily absorb a new affordable development. Uh, and we're not aware right now of any new development, affordable developments that are in the planning pipeline, we know there's one under construction. Um, home ownership, solid demand for home ownership. Um, we think right now, you know, depending on if we get another big influx of folks or some great new employment opportunity lands in town, we think right now a lot of the existing housing can be used um, for people in the market. The other thing is that there are units that appear to us to be decent good units that if people were able to use the existing down payment assistance program that the city's had for a number of years that there's enough money there under that $15,000 limit that they probably can make the gap to 
to get into our home. Um, talking about the role of government, this is another one of our major tasks that we were given. You know, government involvement is critical because of just what we were talking about with this regulation. Um, the federal government understands at least this much that because there are all of these regulatory considerations that they place on the whole housing market before it ever gets to the local level, that there's got to be some kind of evening at the landscape. And that's part of why they have a variety of federal affordable housing programs where they make funds available to communities. Currently, as the federal government budget is also under pressure, there's greater and greater emphasis from the federal government that they want to be partners with the state and with the local governments. And what that means by being partners, yes, it means cooperating on plans, all that sort of thing. It also means belling up to the bar with some of the cash needed to make some of this stuff happen. Uh, the reality is government does not build the housing. You know, private, for-profit, and non-profit groups build the housing, including public housing authorities. Um, but again, too, because local governments have such an impact on the land use policies and on the infrastructure investments, uh, it's important that they have an array of incentives to try to help offset you know, some of the places where the market can't work uh, because of the regulatory burden and because of decisions that are made you know, in a representative government. I think the good news is the city of Long has demonstrated over the years leadership, and I think that's part of why there is a healthy picture and this community does have you know, a solid base of a good jobs housing balance um, because they ha they have been involved in trying to look at you know what parts of the market do people need help so that they can be both an employee and a resident here in Longmont and those those programs have worked. Um, you know, the city council recently um, ceased the payment of the loop program and that produced funds that helped do a lot of help support a lot of developments. Uh, of affordable housing across the community. And, uh, we're not, you know, we're, we, we take the history, what's here is here, but if you look at the amount of money that was able to be invested, um, if Longmont's going to still continue to be an active player, uh, money's going to have to come from somewhere. Some of the federal funds like CBG, I think the city's going to have to focus more on, okay, if we have good housing opportunities, does it make sense to use that money for housing opportunities? Previous task force have looked at other revenue enhancements, and those revenue enhancements, I think, will never move forward, partially because they had the payment and loop program that grew over the years. Um, but the city has looked in the past at maybe having some kind of employee employment fee or a head tax, as some communities call it, because again, you have a lot of this, this commuting that goes on back and forth. And um, we looked at, even if, even if there was an assessment of a dollar a month per employee on all employees within the community would generate 371000 a year. Uh, and a dollar is not going to throw anybody into poverty, we don't think. Um, and again, having that ability to, to have money to invest in some of these priority housing needs would be great. Also, you could do a very small cut on, on sales tax. There's some room compared to some of the other uh, front range communities on the sales tax rate, even just a tenth of a percent you know, could produce a million dollars a year. Um, I'm not saying, you know, you've got the leaguer taxpayers that are feeling pressured by a lot of things, but again, as the market starts to come back around, I think people are going to be looking again saying, well, what are the solutions? How can we keep the positive jobs housing balance that we've had in the long run? Um, and I think creating those tools is kind of your job, um, and I think you've got a lot of good work, and. You know, we've been very excited for providing the kind of in-depth data that hopefully will help make your deliberations um, uh, more informed and hopefully it will give you some ideas on some directions you might want to formulate and make recommendations to the community. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. One more. There's one more slide, Tom. Huh? Okay. No, uh, I skipped it. Oh. oh, okay, yes, community. Emphasis on affordability. I mean, that's the thing, you know, Longmont historically has said one of the strong points they have is that we have housing that's affordable. And uh, we're not just talking about affordable only to the very lowest income people. It's affordable to the workforce, and that's part of why employers are located here. That will continue to be a drawing card for employers as they look up and down 
you know, these northern Front Range communities, and you can see the comparisons. Longmont's got a lot to offer for, for employees. Um, I think another thing important part of the affordable housing program the Longmont's run is it's actually helped people from getting overextended, and we saw that with a lot of with a lot of what's gone on in, in the non-qualifying loans and you know some of the banks and other mortgage um, originators you know trying to push people into homes that were more expensive. The people that come through city programs they're vetted very well and. You know, they get help, you know, when you're looking at their budget and they're not pushed into something they can't afford, and that's an important quality. Um, I think as a community, we have to support partnerships between government and the private sector. You know, we have to say, yes, we're going to step up and partner with the private sector to get a diverse supply of housing in our community. Um, and I think we have to continue as church members and members of charitable groups to encourage our members both to donate money and to donate time. There are many great volunteer projects uh, going on, you know, like Habitat for Humanity and other elderly fix-up projects that go on in the community. Those are important. The other thing, and we all face this, you know, no matter where we live, if you start to hear talk of a new affordable development or a new multifamily housing project, are you willing to say, well, the community needs it? We're growing, we have to have decent housing with people as we become a larger community. And a lot of times those neighborhood, you know, opposition add add cost to a project or it costs projects that could be good projects not to happen at all. Uh, and both the developer investment and the community investment is lost. Uh, if if we can't work together in neighborhoods to say well, yes we do need a diverse housing stuff. So Questions. Questions. A lot to digest. Well, the, the report will be emailed to all of us. Or do we have to go to the city website and download it? Or? Um, just the report. You know, part of this, the housing stuff, takes so long to produce that we really need to be looking at what's it going to look like in five and ten years. Mm -hmm. And so the demographic stuff and some of the income data and housing cost data, did y'all run any projections of what that might look like in ten years? So, because my fear years, is... We my, did a five-year projection. Five years out. Um, five years out. Um, in the report, it's not in this presentation, but there is a an analysis of as the number of households grow by that 4,000 estimated in the next five, yeah, yeah. Thousand, a, thousand a year, right? Thousand, yeah. thousand a year. Um, if you assume that they would fall in the same tenure and income ranges, what that's going to do to increase the pressures. So and that is right now, too, Terry, part of the challenge yeah. is what is the employment side going to do? Because nobody is making employment projections. I think everybody's still so puzzled over what. The new economy is going to be yeah. um, following this period we're in. That you know nobody's talking about employment <coughs> now. There'll there'll be employment. I mean, people will figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think the city projects or ha says that there could be a build out of forty thousand more jobs in Longmont, but we could not gather information that would help us make a projection based on future job growth, except for the population and household. There's no new employer that we know that's coming in or any large bump that we would yeah, estimate based on this. Population growth is both internal growth and moving growth. Yes. Um, on your recommendations, do, do you have um, other communities that might have uh, the sales tax? Do any other communities have their sales tax? Could you repeat the question in the microphone? Yes. The well, question was, um, are there other communities that have implemented any of the recommendations you make? Well, you've got a very close neighbor down the road in Boulder that devotes, um, I think, a tenth of a percent of sales tax to affordable housing programs. Uh, then there are a number of communities in the state that do have the head tax. Of course, Denver, I think, was the first one to put that in, and theirs is fairly high. I think it's fifty dollars an employee a year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but there have been some communities that have done that. We have kind of an interesting challenge in the state because of the Tabor Amendment. 
um, almost any tax question has got to go to a full vote of the people. And a lot of times it's difficult to convince people uh, that they need to pay any more tax, even though uh, they may understand that they would reap part of the direct benefits of it. You know, in the report, I make the comparison on the tax that some people say sales tax is regressive because the people with the least income have to pay it. But at the same time, those are also many of the people that will benefit from affordable housing. And it's kind of like in some communities around the state, they've started increasing the dog licensing fees to create these dog parks where you can have your dog off, off leash. Well, that's a direct benefit. If you get to participate in that, it's worth paying an extra fee. Uh, so I think some of that we just have to help people understand the link that, you know, if this makes a better community and it makes a place for your kids and your grandkids to have better housing, then it's a worthwhile investment. Do you know of any communities that have an ad valorem tax? Um, that, that's another, that, that's another possibility. That, that is another possibility too. Could you explain more about that? Um, that he asked about an ad valorem tax, which would be a tax that would be part of the real estate taxes that we pay now, and that that that's a possibility. I think again, too, if that were going to be a new earmark, it would have to go to a vote. Other questions? That's not very many questions. Sam. Thinking. Your study of uh, housing plus transportation, where we are one of the lowest, comparing to the prices, which mean the, price, the folks who live in tri cities work here. Is that correct? They're, they're working here or other places or other around. Places. Places. And and that, that, yes. How does it compare, or how do we take this? good study that you have done and use it for affordable housing in the Tri-Cities area. What the, the what question was how, how can we take the housing plus transit um, and then look at that in terms of what could be provided in the Tri-Cities areas. Well I think that is one of the interesting questions about this whole how we're going to manage the movement up and down 25 uh, because some of the newer communities you know they're Quite frankly, multifamily housing is not on their radar. Um, so that I think that that is a definite question, and my guess is probably a lot of employees that may work at the American Furniture Warehouse, for instance, probably live in Longmont. Um, and and that I think is 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 one of the challenges, unless some regional agreements, um, you know, can be accommodated over time, both in terms of you know fiscal policy as well as you know how do we share. You know the regional need for employee housing. I, I think too an interesting thing we did some research a couple of years ago for a, a grant that we wrote um, for Dr. Cog, a sustainability grant with HUD, and we looked at one of the arguments we were making is that high transit costs uh, can precipitate foreclosures, and because people end up not being able to afford both, and we went back and looked in this particularly this northeastern quadrant on the eastern side of 25, that is where the foreclosures happen with the greatest concentration. And in some ways, that's where the problem started in Colorado. And that was where people had those high transit costs. And when gas got to $4, I think there were a number of people that said, we've got to do something different. We can't hang on to this place and, and, and pay the car bill too. My concern is that if we, uh, at, at, I should say, as we invest more in affordable housing in Longmont, then we will be attracting the lower income folks to Longmont, while those who can afford the transportation will go to the tri cities. Yes, the question, and I think that's a good question, is will, if we, if we try to keep up with our demand, what happens in these other communities if they don't if they don't address it and they they say well we're going to keep our housing just for uh, the people who can afford the single family homes uh, and I, I like I said I think that that is a, a legitimate regional discussion you know some of that has been held there's been some some debate because really it's also it, it's also people talk about it 
um, you know, with in, in Denver, for instance, um, a lot of people feel that Denver has more uh, more modestly priced rental housing than some of the suburbs do, um, and it's been it's been very difficult to get regional agreement uh, to talk about kind of what the way that's phrased is they talk about a fair share housing policy. Um, in California, for instance, it's a law. It, each municipality has to address their fair share of housing obligations, and in order to qualify to get their State Department of Transportation and State Health Department money, and the, that, the state of California, because of course the housing there is really a problem, uh, they've realized that each community does have you know, some responsibility for trying to balance the jobs and the housing in their community. Um, I think Longmont, one of the things that's, that it does show too is that Longmont is an employment center and um, it does have, I mean, it's the demand for rental housing is coming from within, people who identify themselves as Longmont residents. You know, it's not, there's not that many people coming from the outside for that type of housing. And the percent of owners in some of those communities, I mean, the people that live there aren't necessarily going to be drawn, I don't think, to Longmont for rentals um, as much as employees who are here or in this area are going to be drawn to Longmont. Can, uh, can you speak to the um, forum of Dr. Cog and what kind of collaboration is going on currently, the history a little bit of it? Um, the question is, what kind of role is Dr. Cog playing and is Dr. Cog contributing to discussions of kind of the regional cooperation? Yes, they are, and they recently received a HUD sustainability grant, which kind of the, the focus of that is to encourage regional cooperation and to identify um, issues like housing, like transit, like employment, um, and try to do a more holistic job of planning. Um, and you have, you know, you have some interesting, I mean, here you have the, the I-25 corridor, and even 119, I think, is an amazing commuting pipeline. Um, but you have those two things in Denver, you have the light rail system now, and they've had some of the similar challenges where the light rail system intersects Denver County and Jefferson County. You know, where are we gonna have affordable employee housing is it going to be on the Jefferson County side, the Denver side? Dr. Cog's been involved in trying to both make money available for planning so that some of the uh, stations on the Lakewood side and going west in Jefferson County have the ability to know what kind of infrastructure investments they need to be able to provide some more affordable housing along those rail lines. Um, it's also, the, the discussions are also taking place with Denver and Aurora. Uh, as they do that line along 225. Uh, and I, I think, you know, Metro Wide, we have some real challenges, um, you know, on how we're going to deal with this, with this issue of regionalism because people are just so much more mobile. Um, yeah, do you have time? One more question. You know, one of the things going on, a lot of people, are families are doubling up. Their kids are moving back. And so that's what I think the USA Today might have had a front page article about sharing housing, sharing cars. Is there any ACS data or anything that addresses kind of how that's moving in the market? Because a lot of it's related to affordability. Some of it may relate to choice of lifestyle as well. So is that that's, something that's, that's coming our way? That is very true. We There is some... ACS data, it's kind of hard to get at doubling up. We've tried on some other studies where you have to dig down into some um, household type data. Um, and, and we weren't looking as much in this study at homelessness or other yeah. things like that. So we didn't, we did not do that. Um, but the ACS, and I can't remember the exact table to tell you now. Um, you can sort of get it doubling up, but they're not really good at, yeah. at tracking that. I mean, you can look at household size if it was growing, yeah. um, or how, how often people are moving. Right. Um, what I found, usually a school district data is the best, because they have to track homeless kids or yeah, doubled up. And that's again for that real super low income population. But it's true. It's just, I think that's everywhere. I think yeah, you true. that is happening here. It's happening everywhere that we've been looking at recently for any housing study. 
um, that you have families moving back in with parents, you have two families living together, you have you know kids having to trek across town because they've moved into another house with a, a second family. And, and it's get that it's, kind of part of the new normal that we need to be thinking about and the market might be able to Yeah, or, or a family forms with a, a, an adult child who gets married but no one Senior, moves out. Seniors with other families that aren't yep. You know, senior co but there's co-housing approaches as well, and senior co-housing approaches. Mm -hmm. So some of those more congregate models, I'm just wondering what's going on with that. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't hear of anything going on in Longmont with any new senior, senior development that was looking at any um, specific models where you might have some more congregate housing or yeah. patio housing. Different than what Michael's doing now. It's just a different kind of model. But yeah. Anyhow. If I could piggyback on that question. Oh, I did hear it from you that you're building patio homes, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I may break this down too simply. I'm not a statistician or a data head, but it seems like there's, well, per, first of all, one of our core charges is trying to understand and assess what the need is in long run. And it seems like there's really sort of three categories of, of, of housing. There's ownership, there's rental, and there's other, which could be anything from doubling up to uh, you know, short-term homeless assistance and everything in between. With the data you've collected, would you have the ability to, maybe it already exists in the report, on a regional scale, look at where Longmont is on those first two, the ownership and the rental, because those really end up being our charge. And, and in other words, to discover maybe 50% you know, of households own in Longmont and the regional average is 60, in, in which case we, we would have a problem. Maybe it's the opposite. We just don't know but how to assess. And, and what we did in the comparison, how we did that was looking at the comparison of communities. Um, and there are charts in the report that show the home ownership rate in each and the um, now that doesn't include Boulder, but it does include surrounding similar communities. Um, and just the raw ownership and rental numbers, not the transit. Oh, the transit. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of information that I didn't put in the presentation in there that's in that. Um, and jobs, um, median prices. Let's see. Um, I think we've got rents. Um, so you should go in there, vacancy rates, how many units are on the market. So there's there's additional data that we can show you. Um, there isn't anything necessarily about uh, special needs or seniors. Or what would the things that I'm reading through it, looking through the first several pages, is that the, the report really seems to support maybe a market-based approach to the issue that is in front of us, and that is, you know, letting uh, you know, builders and developers kind of make the judgment on their, on their own and, and, and let allow them to do some of the research and find out what's going to sell and what's going to rent and, and what is not. Um, and that makes sense to me. Then I get to the fact that it's, it's well, we need to, to, to try and institute a tax in order to... Uh, Increase the level of governmental oversight, and, and so that, that seems to be a little bit of a uh, you know a conflict there. Can, can, can you address that for me? Yeah, the question basically is um, on the front end, it's looking strongly at the markets and the market demands, and then on the back end, it's like emphasizing the government role. Well, I think, I think that's only partially true. I think that what we are, I guess our message would be is the long amount housing market has worked pretty well over the years, uh, and the housing producers, you know, private builders have done a good job of kind of keeping up with the growth that's happened in Longmont. At the same time, Longmont, uh, and, and, you know, and one of the things we say in the report, report is that really developers and builders, they're balance sheet driven. Well, what that means is that you know they have to they have to deal with both assets and liabilities, and they're not going to go into a development project and end up 
with the negative at the end of it. They can't do it, or you know that's that's death in their business. Uh, so if you if you say to a, a, a developer, well, we want some rental housing, uh, and we know it's going to cost you one hundred twenty five or one hundred thirty thousand to make nice rental housing that the community is proud of, that people are happy living in, but we know you can only rent it for eight hundred a month, and that your debt service is going to be seven fifty a unit, and your operating costs are three thousand a unit. The, the builder's not going to do that. They can't do it because it puts them out of business. So that's where you get into this, the parts of the market, you know, that, that are not perfectly balanced. Yeah, in this community, you know, modest home ownership is certainly within reach. I mean, it's there. But when you start looking at what it takes to develop good quality rental housing and looking at the incomes of the people that need that rental housing, it's tough without some some assistance from charity, from the government, from everybody, to get that down to a price where the developer is, is making something for his time and his risk, uh, versus saying, well, I can't do it because I'm not going to go bankrupt. And, and that's I think that's really the challenge. That we do have a privately based housing market, um, and the government's kind of a, developed this this odd. I, I kind of look at it in some ways, you know, you've got this big market of supply and demand, and then, you know, the government kind of works around the edges trying to clean up the little instances of market failure where, you know, we don't want people living on the streets. Uh, we'd rather have decent, you know, nice rental housing for kids to grow up in and for the elderly to live in than just have, you know, converted garages for people. 49, I suppose we could around 1750, rent restricted physical units in one lot. So those are each an apartment or a house. And then on top of that, um, the housing authorities and, and other agencies have a voucher um, totaling about 700 and something vouchers. Um, those are a um, rent subsidy that a household gets and they are able to go out into the market and rent a market rate unit as long as it's at a certain rent level. It can't be a luxury apartment. It has to meet a threshold and Michael could tell you all the detail on that. Um, but, but those groups are explicit. They're not overlapping. They are not overlapping. Okay. Now, I will say that when we did our analysis of demand in those lower income ranges, we took vouchers into consideration. So, you know, we when we said there are a certain number of households at 50% or less of the area median income that need a, a, an affordable rental opportunity, um, we've already taken into consideration the households that have access to a voucher. So it's demand on top of everything that's already out there. So I would suggest that that number is skewed going forward, that that program is under, under great strength. And that's one, right. And that number should, in fact, looking in the long term, be in we reduced in our projection. It's being restricted at a rapid rate. Looking five or ten years into yeah, we could do that in the five-year projection if you gave me a you know an average percent decrease in what vouchers and so what Michael is referring to is and Tom also referred to is that as the federal budget is tight and some of these programs are being collapsed or or you know they're shrinking the voucher program you know they you have to serve more less households with the money you have because the money doesn't go as far and so the number of households that are getting vouchers is 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 re reducing over time because of the cost of housing and so that gap analysis that you're doing kind of will we deal with that issue and some of the other major trends that show that gap is growing within certain populations we, yeah we the, we we didn't reduce vouchers in that future. No, that's fine. I mean, you spent all those valuable yeah. variables that make your head explode. Right. There's many variables. Right. A lot of variables. Mm -hmm. They're coming with that. But that's a very good point is that um, those programs that. aren't growing. Those, and those vouchers are in play now. But going forward, those households are at risk. Mm -hmm. Which would increase the demand at the lower because vouchers are held by households typically at 50% of AMI and most likely at 30%. Yeah, less. And in many very cases below 20. Below 20, that's right. They are the very lowest the income households mm -hmm. because they provide the household with a subsidy that makes their housing payment 30% of their income. And so they pay what's affordable to them for their housing 
up to whatever the rent is within reason. So, so this is a good example of a physical building where, where Tom was talking about going around the edges where there's no way that population is going to pay in back with rent. So there are programs that get developed like the tax credit program to try to make that happen within the private sector investment through the tax credit deal. And and those and that's sort of how I think I, I interpreted Tom's piece. It's a, it's a fairly broad, robust private sector market, and yet around the edges there are some there are some weaknesses. And and there are programs over across the country, state, local level, that address those weaknesses. And Longmont's done a pretty good job addressing its local its local weakness through the trust fund mechanism and all of that piece too. And the state has its program, the feds have the tax credit program. So what I think we're talking about is what kind of local program would work around the edges for the local needs in Longmont going forward? Not today, but two, three, four, five years. It's a wide open question. Hope we get there. Now, when you talk about what voucher program, are you talking about the Section 8 housing? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The question was, is that the voucher program? It is the Section 8 rental assistance, yes. And, and I think, too, one point I want to add to what Mike was saying is that, I mean, as you get down lower in the income ranges, and you get down, one of the things I find interesting is when we do studies in communities of their voucher recipients, always the majority of people work. They may not be full-time employed, but they have employment income that comes into that household. But still, many of those incomes, and if you look, I don't know if you get your Social Security report and look at what you're going to be earning, if you look back and see, okay, what did I pay in rent on that 13 or 1400 bucks a month I'm going to get, you, all of a sudden you're in that category of saying, well, I don't have very much rent. And, and part of the challenge, and this is where the housing authorities historically have done the service to the communities that they've housed the very poorest people, and, and many times the, the housing that the housing authorities provide, those people, the rents they pay, they can't even pay the operating expenses. If they didn't have the house subsidies, they couldn't even keep the heat and the lights on in place. And, and you know that that's something I think nationally we're going to have to address. Is you know how, how can we you know make that work uh, for the long term? Yeah. 